All right. Thanks so much, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, much appreciated. Um, again, so my name is Robert. I'm going to be talking about garage rock this week. Um, it's a subgenre of rock and roll that started around the 1960s. Um, one that I particularly enjoy listening to um, because it's a little bit more obscure than some of the, the standard rock and roll um, from the 60s and even a little bit early 70s um, that you traditionally hear on, say, like classic rock radio. Uh, and, and the sound of the music to me is very raw, very natural. <clears throat> so that's one other reason that I think makes it a little bit interesting to listen to from maybe um, an artistic perspective. Um, well, I'm only going to cover a few bands today, and my, my lecture is going to be a, a little bit shorter than other weeks. Mostly just due to the length of the songs. Um, but there are also being fewer musical examples this week um, than the last couple of weeks. Uh, I probably will do other lectures on Garage Rock as well in the future, covering other bands. Uh, maybe doing even a bit more of a theme with them. Like uh, I'd like to maybe do a lecture about Canadian garage rock or um, other obs obscure garage rock bands that maybe um, didn't sing in English, for example. Um, but for today, I'm just going to sort of do like a, a general overview. So some of this information I addressed already. Um, garage rock is a subgenre of rock and roll. Um, the term began to originate in the, in the 1970s. Um, originally, these bands from the 1960s didn't refer to themselves as garage rock groups. Um, they just considered themselves to be rock and roll. Um, it's defined by low fidelity, so that, that sort of goes hand in hand with what I was talking about, with there being a very raw, natural sound. Um, and, and many of these bands had a DIY approach, a do-it-yourself approach, um, because sometimes it was difficult for them to attract attention. They didn't necessarily have the most overtly commercial sound, um, so sometimes they are given sort of the bottom of the barrel in terms of like recording time or recording rates, recording technology and, and things like that. The genre can also be called proto-punk and indeed there's a lot of similarities between the music that some of these garage rock bands were creating in the 1960s um, that really predates what we began to see in the 70s and 80s um, with what would later be defined as punk music. You can see on the side there, there's a, a couple of pictures of some garage rock bands. Um, they, they traditionally dressed like regular rock and roll bands from the 60s. They don't look particularly um, subversive or, or perhaps visually different um, from other mainstream groups at the time, like the Beatles, for example, also, also wore suits, just like the Shags are doing up there in the top picture. Um, but the sound of their music, which we'll hear, um, is really, really quite different uh, from, say, the sound of the Beatles for example. This album up here at the very top, um, it's, it's called Nuggets, and there was Volume 2 released as well. Um, it's a compilation of garage rock bands, and it's sort of gone on to be a standard compilation to listen to. Uh, every song, or pretty much every song, is really, really good, well worth listening to, uh, and it, it's a, a wide variety of artists across both Nuggets compilations. I think there's about 26 tracks on each compilation and uh, about 25 or 26 different bands uh, across those tracks. So that's a good starting point to really, really sink your teeth into this genre. Um, the very last point here, revived throughout subsequent decades. Yeah, definitely. I mean, garage rock has never really gone away in popularity. Um, even, even though these bands may not have been as popular in the 1960s as other mainstream groups, um, their music has continued to be heard, and indeed that's why we know, still know about it today. So I'm only going to cover three bands today. Um, yeah, like I was saying, it's going to be a little bit shorter. Um, but these are our three garage rock bands who, for me, really define the sound of, of what I enjoy about garage rock. Um, really raw, heavy, um, aggressive guitar tones. Um, and, and yeah, these are basically just three groups that, that I really enjoy listening to. So first, we're going to listen to the Sonics. Um, they're an American rock band. They were formed in 1960. Um, by, by a group of teenagers at the time, um, just friends from high school and people who knew each other around town. They had a lot of early lineup changes, uh, and indeed they didn't produce their first record, or really, I should rather say, release their first record until 1965. 
Um, but as a band from that time, 1960 to 65, in the early years, they were locally popular in Tacoma, Washington, um, where they were formed, and best known as a five-man group. So drums, guitar, bass, keyboard, saxophone, um, and then various members of the group would sing as well. The lineup of the band uh, is, a, is a pretty interesting to me, the fact that they had a saxophone player. Um, that's something that was more traditional in, say, 1950s rock and roll music. Um, not really something we tend to think of as dominating ma the mainstream rock and roll sound of the 1960s or 1970s. Um, but for me, the Sonics really find a, w a way to make it work. Um, and the song we're going to listen to, um, a cover of a Little Richard tune, makes great use of the saxophone. So like I was saying, um, the Sonics for me are, are a typical garage rock band in terms of sound. Um, it could definitely be called proto-punk. There, there are a lot of elements um, that we're going to hear in the Sonics music that bear similarities to later punk music. Um, the music, it's, it's fast, loud, aggressive, um, distorted, really guitar-driven, really driven by a simple one, two, three, four beat. And the recordings themselves, um, I mentioned earlier low fidelity, but the Sonics sort of took that to an extreme. Um, most of their music was recorded on only a two-track recorder with one mic for the drum kit, and they pretty much just recorded live in the studio. Um, for their second album, this one that you can see the picture of, Boom, um, they actually ripped off the soundproofing of the walls in the studio to get a liver sound, um, to sort of increase that sense of, of fastness or loudness or aggressiveness. Um, the first two albums from the Sonics are really the ones that garage rock enthusiasts are interested in. Um, their third album, they moved to, I believe it was Hollywood, and to, um, their sound kind of changed. Um, they, they signed on with a new producer, a new record company. They tried to become more commercial, uh, and, and many people say it didn't really quite work. Nevertheless, the band is still around today. Again, they mostly focus on just the material from their first two records. That's sort of what they're best known for. Um, they still preserve that, that traditional five-man lineup, uh, even though some of the original members don't play with the group anymore. But So let's take a listen uh, to one of their songs. We're going to listen to the song Have Love, Will Travel. Like I was saying, it's a, it's a Little Richard tune, uh, and you'll definitely hear some elements of punk, um, a very simple riff just repeated over and over and over again. Um, as, as well, great use of the saxophone, which was quite unusual uh, for 1960s rock bands. All right, great song. But moving forward um, to the next band on my list here, um, Bent Wind. They're even a little bit more obscure than the Sonics. Bent Wind was a Canadian rock band. Um, they were formed sometime in the 1960s in Toronto. We're not exactly sure when. Um, they released only one album. This record that you can see on the side there, called Sussex, in 1969. Uh, it was named after the particular recording studio where it was made in Toronto. And original copies of the record uh, are extremely rare today. It's a very collectible record, so it has been reissued on vinyl, so it's, it's not too difficult to find the reissue. Um, the tracks are up on YouTube, um, but original copies of the record itself are, are really tough to find. The reason for this is, um, the band only estimates about 500 copies were made, uh, and very few of which were sold to the general public. Um, they did get put out for sale in record stores, but just nobody bought them. Um, so most of the copies wound up being returned to the band, um, who they themselves actually um, destroyed a significant number of them. They just played frisbee with them because nobody wanted them. Or um, Marty Roth, who's, who's one of the main members of the band, he owned a record store. Um, in the 1980s, and he was just using them to decorate his wall, um, like hanging them on the wall and putting nails in them. Um, these record, this record now that is probably easy, easily worth five figures uh, for, for a nice original copy. Um, but Bentwin themselves, they began ga gaining some notoriety among record collectors in the 1980s, uh, and it's mostly because of that that their music today has survived. Um, they continue, there continues to be an interest in, in the music that they made in 1969 and around that period. Um, like I was saying, Marty Roth continues to be active. He has a YouTube channel um, where he, he talks about Bent Wind and releases Bent Wind media. Um, for example, one of the things that he's since released um, is this, you can see the picture of the album at the bottom, um, the Lost Ryerson tapes. Uh, it's a warm-up 
audition recording kind of thing, um, a rehearsal, I guess would be a better word, um, that the band performed at Ryerson University before doing a concert. So it was never intended to be released as an album, um, but there's some pretty cool tracks on there that you can hear. Um, for example, a, a cover of, El of the Beatles' Eleanor Rigby, uh, which is pretty interesting. But we're going to listen to the first song from Sussex, uh, Touch of Red. Um, again, the, the music that you're going to hear, it's going to be loud, raw, aggressive, and in this particular case, uh, the recording is even going to be a little bit more low fidelity um, than what we heard from the Sonics. Uh, but I think bear with it, it is a great track. Okay, yeah, great track. So lastly, uh, moving forward, final group that we're going to take a look at today um, is this band Frigid Pink from Detroit. Um, so just a little bit south of Toronto. Um, of the three bands that, that we looked at, these guys probably came the closest to becoming mainstream. Um, they had a, a fairly long career by the standards of most garage rock groups. Um, they were originally active from 1967 to 1975, and they originally emerged out of various cover bands. So local groups around Detroit who were covering popular mainstream bands, um, they were sort of all playing together in the same circuit, and in general the members knew each other. And so Frigid Pink kind of emerged out of that conglomerate of musicianship. Um, somewhat funnily enough, I think the band is best known for a cover. Um, they're known for their cover of House of the Rising Sun, um, which we'll take a look at, or rather we'll listen to. Uh, and you know, going hand in hand with what I was saying about how the band, this band is probably one of the closest garage rock groups to achieve mainstream popularity, um, Led Zeppelin actually once opened for them. So not the other way around. But Led Zeppelin came on stage first and said, hey, I know you guys are all here for Frigid Pink, um, but we're going to play a quick set um, before they come on stage. So pretty interesting, I think. I mean, Led Zeppelin, they started touring around America in 1969. Um, Frigid Pink at this point would have already been too active for at least two years formally and, and even longer than that informally um, when that Led Zeppelin came around Detroit. You can see a picture of the band um, nowadays on the right there. Um, they've re re they continue to make new music, um, so they've, they've since reformed. Um, but the song that we're going to listen to, I'm actually just going to go back a slide, um, is from their first album. So this one up here at the top left. And just like all the other music that we've heard so far, um, the focus of the song is on heavy, loud, distorted guitar, strong, driving rhythms. Um, and yeah, let, let's take a listen to that right now. Uh, so yeah, they were popular, and um, they were getting a lot of radio play. Um, they lasted uh, for eight years, um, but one of the reasons why they never sort of achieved superstardom um, had to do with various lineup changes, um, sort of record to record, the band kept changing, um, and then contract negotiations in the 1970s, um, sort of resulted in, in a breakdown between the band and management uh, and they kind of just sort of faded away a little bit after that. Um, they did release more records after their first two, but again like the Sonics, the fir their first two records are really how most people um, define the group sonically. And in, ter in part, excuse me, in terms of, of the band's legacy, I mean they are still remembered today. Um, like I said, and, and we can see on the side there, that they are still releasing music. Um, but not only that, in 2013, they were inducted into Michigan's Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So that's the end. Um, thanks, everyone, again, for tuning in, for listening. Um, again, a, a little bit shorter this week, um, but slightly fewer musical examples, shorter mu musical examples. Um, I do still try to provide roughly the same amount of information and, and content week to week. Um, if you're interested in my slides, um, and I do have many more slides than I've presented so far, you can take a look at my store um, on Teachers Pay Teachers. Um, as well, besides slides, I've started uploading some other things, um, like coloring pages to help students learn uh, the keys on a keyboard. Um, I am a music teacher, um, and I provide that service, uh, as well as English services, such as proofreading and editing at, at Fiverr. Um, where you can find me there, also under the username Dr. Robert. Um, if you're just more interested in free stuff, um, you can read my blog on WordPress. Uh, right now I'm doing a project around classical music, um, called Classical Music Doesn't Suck, 
And it's true. It really doesn't. There's a lot of cool classical music out there, um, which I post and talk about, or rather write about on my blog. Um, so that's well worth reading. You can also check out my thesis, which is available um, through Google Scholar. If you search for Robert McKnight iPod, um, it's the first thing that comes up. As well, the links are below on my Twitch page um, to my YouTube channel, where I post my lectures afterwards, um, as well to my Twitter, where I, I randomly throughout the week um, post links to, to various songs and music that I'm listening to. So that's it. Enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Thanks again for tuning in. Uh, see all of you later.